Well, bonjour à tous. Hello, everyone. Um, just wanted to start my talk with a short message of support for my colleagues in UK universities and at Queen's, who are currently striking for fair pay, fair pension, um, against zero, zero hour contracts and preca precarity, because I would have liked to join them, but instead of uh, I'm here, uh, which obviously it means a lot to me as well. But if you don't know about the strike, please look it up, because international support um, means a lot to them as well. So um, my presentation um, is titled Threshold Spaces, the unexpected link between interior paintings and our nouveau architecture. Um, I'm actually very glad uh, Françoise Aubry did her talk and introduction about um, broader concerns about interiors in Art Nouveau and including paintings as well, um, because I'm going to look uh, at some of those issues as well in my presentation. Um, in particular, I will make the case for um, exploring the connections between threshold spaces in architecture and in paintings um, through, like I said, their shared concern for this uh, transition space, the threshold spaces. So the 19th century um, has been described by many scholars as a society that relied heavily on categorization, um, on the separation of spheres. And why, what they mean by that is that you have on one hand a private sphere, um, which is associated with uh, women, um, the domestic, um, houses, and things like that. And on the other hand, you have the public sphere, which is associated with men, um, work, all the important stuff. Um, and obviously, so these, this private and public sphere coinciding with uh, gender, class, and economic boundaries. Um, Victoria Rosner um, has shown how threshold spaces can be difficult to deal with in this economy of uh, private sphere um, because there are these transition spaces. And she writes um, that a way of life built around separation and specialization encounters difficulty when faced with transitional or in-between states that resist categorization. And such states are architecturally embodied in the threshold, the space that forms a, bit, a bridge between two discrete rooms. So in the same way that society assigned roles to people, um, it assigned roles to um, rooms and different spaces. So it shows the relevance of studying the threshold um, as an architecturally, but also as a socially and symbol symbolically significant space. And especially um, when it is undergoing cha changes, at this is, as it is the case with Art Nouveau architecture. Um, yeah, so um, cor spaces like corridors, doors, um, smaller rooms appeared in the 18th century. I mean, that's a bit of a overgeneralization, but to simplify, the, many of, of these spaces appeared in the 18th century to enhance intimacy. But what we see at the end of the 19th century is that there is a progressive uh, removal and blurring of spatial boundaries within the homes, and it is especially the case with um, Art Nouveau architecture, at least um, part of the architects um, within that style. And they begin to experiment with uh, removing walls and opening up spaces inside the home. Um, and they were doing this because they were focusing a lot on the linking and the fluidity of space. So the transition between uh, reception rooms were mediated by things like glass doors, um, stairs, or uh, curtains, uh, shelves, and things like that. And uh, Vincent Aymans, who has written a book about uh, bourgeois domestic architecture in the end of the 19th century in Belgium, has written that um, la faiblesse de la maison bourgeoise classique réside dans son manque chronique d'ambiance. Les lumières, les couleurs, les enchaînements de perceptions restent souvent médiocres. Par contre, l'art nouveau tend vers un aboutissement et une unification des expressions spatiales. So what he highlights here um, is the unification process that merged different spaces together in Art Nouveau architecture. 
Um, and we see that at the same time, in paintings, these threshold spaces are becoming increasingly important as well, as a lot of artists are focusing on um, depicting doors, uh, windows, or are framing their image in such a way that several rooms are represented in the same painting. Um, what you might ask yourself at this point is that, um, is it possible or is it even relevant to um, study in a comparative way the threshold spaces in architecture and in painting? Well, that's a very good question. And Vincent and Aymans in the same book, um, and I believe I've seen that maybe he's in the room, so sorry about that, <laughs> has argued that um, interior paintings cannot be used as a reliable way to study interiors and architecture um, because they would only reflect the creativity of the painter. And recent research has also shown that um, symbolism and art nouveau, who would be two of the main, most important artistic movements at the time, uh, would be unrelated to each other because there are no, or hardly any, um, traces of direct collaboration. Well, it's true that um, there are a few paintings that are directly representing existing interior, at least um, in Belgium. Uh, we've seen an example with the presentation of François Aubry in the house of uh, Karl Hoffmann, I believe. Um, in that case, you, had a, you have a painting that directly represents an existing interior. But even when this is not the case, um, there are subtler links between interiors in architecture and interiors in painting. And I'm going to first um, point to three main ones. Um, there has been an important book called um, The Emergence of the Interior, written par by uh, Charles Rice, who was, uh, which was, it was a book important in the field of interior studies. And he has pointed towards the doubleness of interiors' meanings. Um, because it exists both as a spatial reality and as an image. And he writes, um, the interior emerged with significance as a physical, three-dimensional space, as well as an image. Significantly doubleness involves the interdependence between image and space, with neither sense being primary. And indeed, if you look at historical French dictionaries, um, you see that the definition of interior as the interiors of one's home appeared in 1798, but then as early as 1835, um, interior as both the meaning of um, the interior of a house, the domestic life, but also its representation, and mostly, uh, especially in painting. So significantly for my argument, Art Nouveau architecture is an architecture that um, is best, or at least that would be my perception, is best apprehended through the sense of vision, um, because there is an emphasis on light, there is an emphasis on colors, um, there is an emphasis on opening up spaces and perspective. Uh, so they share actually these visual qualities with paintings. Um, secondly, um, a lot of major artists in the end of the 19th century were involved with the interior. Uh, you can think, for example, of James Sensor, Fernand Knopf, uh, Georges Lebrun. Um, they were all either designing their, their own house or developing a collection or um, decorating their interior. Um, and so they did not use their domestic environment as a simple backdrop. Um, for their paintings, but they were actually fashioning their own interior. Um, and in that sense, for these artists, there was a coming and going between the images they produced and the interiors they were inhabiting and fashioning for themselves. And it's, this fact alights um, the closeness of, between um, interior and image um, that I have underlined and that uh, the book of Charles Rice as underlies as well. Uh, finally, um, many architects and painters articulate their reflection around interior spaces with um, questions about fluidity and the challenges of boundaries 
and the challenges of traditional roles um, of different spaces. And here I have two images. Uh, one is of the Orta house, uh, built by the architect Victor Orta. And then the other image is a painting by um, Theo van Rieselberg, a portrait of François van Rieselberg's children. And there is a useful comparison to draw here um, between these two images, and I will go for it with you. So here, um, in the picture of the Horta house, we have a view from the salon into the dining uh, room. And um, we see that all the spaces are visually interconnected. So if you're sitting in the salon, you can have access to the dining room, at least visually. Um, and here, on this painting, you can see that you have all the children um, on the foreground, but then if you look at the, this very bizarre thing <laughs> in the background where you have um, a space with several doors open that actually um, don't really lead somewhere, but you have the same idea of um, being into one space and having visually access to another space. Um, and both um, many architects and many painters at the time took care of opening up perspectives, of visually giving access to different spaces. They introduced distance um, in this way. And, but as you can see, this unfolding of space, uh, particularly in the painting, is uh, quite ambiguous because it doesn't lead to... Um, it doesn't lead you to somewhere you can identify or you can see precisely. Um, and at this stage, it's useful to know that um, our nouveau architecture, however um, revolutionary it may be considered, um, retained a lot of the separations and a lot of the categorizations that were in use in traditional uh, bourgeois house. And because it has no bearing walls, technically, it could have no distinctions between rooms um, at all, but to some extent, it does retain them. Um, and you, you can see, if you have visited the Orta house, you can see as well that the layout of the house remained very faithful to class distinctions because um, there is no way um, that the servant quarters could interact with the main part of the house. Um, so the spatial boundaries are still there, they're just displaced further, they're moved towards the edge. Um, and so in the Hota House, this ability of moving freely through space would be only the privilege of a very few people. So we'll now um, examine two cases of threshold spaces, stairs and curtains, to see uh, to which extent spatial boundaries um, were not only displaced, as, as I've just explained, but also challenged in certain contexts. Um, so in the hotel, sorry if I just come back uh, to this image for a bit, you have the main staircase. You don't, you only see it. Um, you only see ver a very small part of it, but it's directly connected to the main um, living spaces. So it's not, um, you know, hidden in a corridor or hidden in a hallway, which would be um, very typical of some Art Nouveau architecture. Um, so what we can see about transition space and threshold spaces in Art Nouveau is that this very fact that they try to render them seamless also highlights them and give them a central position and a central importance in the house. And in this painting, which is The Children of Mr. Neff by uh, Fernand Knopf, um, we see, if you compare it to the portrait that we've seen just before, we see that here the children literally inhabit the threshold space. So they are not um, on the previous image, they were on the foreground. No, they are on the stairs. Um, the stairs would not um, typically be a place, would be a place where you go by, uh, but you don't typically uh, stand on or linger in or uh, those sorts of things. Um, and here it's used in a rather um, theatrical way 
to as a device to portray the children. But although there is there is what seems to be an open door on the top, uh, we cannot see what lies behind. We have no access, obviously, to what uh, is below um, either. So the focus is on the threshold itself. And in the same way that um, the house of Orta renders ambiguous um, the function and the use of the, its main staircase. Is it a functional element? Is it a decorative element? Uh, is it part of the room or is it outside of it? Um, this painting also transforms the staircase in a space worth um, looking at and worth portraying. So we'll now look at another um, painting of the symbolist painter Fernand Knopf. Um, and we'll talk about curtains. So curtains were starting to be used around uh, the turn of the century um, as a way to rethink the separations between different rooms in architecture, um, not only in Art Nouveau architecture, but partly in Art Nouveau architecture. And here, um, with this portrait of Marie Monon by Fernand Knopf, we see that um, in the background there is a blue curtain be in hanging behind her. Okay. Um, but the background is actually quite, as it is often the case with Knopf anyway, it's quite unclear to understand exactly um, what does it mean or what does it mean in terms of spatial um, configuration because there is this curtain and then there is a lock, so it might be a door behind and then there is a wood pin um, on that side, which might be another door, but we're not sure. Um, so the sitter here is portrayed in a very um, unusual space uh, because uh, it seems, yeah, it seems quite unusual that he would be in front of two doors to have your uh, portrait um, made. Um, and the curtains here, um, in comparison to a door retains the possibility of um, uncovering what lay behind. It has the idea of mobility um, that is, well, inherent to them. And writing about the portrait of Jeanne Keffer, Michel Draguet has underlined the importance of the arch architectural framework and the theatralization of the image in Knopf's portrait. Um, it proved true several years later when um, Knopf gave an architectural shape to um, the images. He created actually some spaces inside the, the home he designed with uh, the architect Edmond Pelzener in 1902 are very rem reminiscent of images that he painted uh, several years before that. Uh, and there, as you can see, um, blue curtains were introduced as room dividers and they were part of what has been described as a very um, as a stage environment and as a very theatrical experience in the sense that the visitors authorized in the villa um, related the very strict journey they had to go through to be able to to be allowed to see the different um, spaces of the home and they were at some point stopped by Knopf's butler uh, so that the painter could take a very um, stage position before they were allowed to see him in the studio, etc. Um, but Knopf was actually not the only one to use curtains um, in a domestic environment as a room divider at the time. Uh, the Austrian and Czech architect Adolf Loos, for example, would do it as well in his home uh, in 1903, although probably uh, those were amongst the first examples. Um, they were also used in um, Art Nouveau architecture. Um, and in Belgium, it is the case, for example, with uh, Serrure et Bovi. And you have here um, an exterior view of the villa he designed for himself, Loeb, but also a view of the salon and the dining room inside the home. And where you can see those curtains there, I believe uh, Françoise Aubry had the picture where they were closed, no, they are open. Um, and you can see that they act as a framing um, and theatrical device, um, something um, that enhance the visual qualities of what you can see, what you can peek through, what you can see behind. Um, 
uh, in this case, through their opening. And in the castle of La Chirelle, um, who was not built by Serrurier Bovy, but whose, uh, which interior design was done by Serrurier Bovy and René Dulong between 1903 and 1901, um, the use of curtains allow an even more radical redefinition of interior space because all the traditional spaces of the dining room, sitting room, uh, smoking room, etc., have been fused into one um, big space, the living room, and curtains are used to de delineate some subsections that are allocated to certain um, functions. But you might wonder um, why curtains and not doors, and why is that even um, relevant as a difference between the two? Well, like I said, they introduced the idea of movement, they introduced the idea of fluidity, they introduced the idea of theatricality, and they play a role in dismantling spatial boundaries by replacing doors with a mobile a mo mobile fabric that can be open, closed, or anything in between, really. So ultimately, thinking about transitions um, in architecture would lead to erase them. Think of about uh, open plan design, for example. Um, but actually, there is a word of possibilities between, you know, fixed p spatial boundaries and uh, their complete erasure. So architects and painters have experimented with several options. And by subverting and the expecting function of a space and by juxtaposing different rooms, um, they ran interior paintings rendered the spaces they depicted more fluid, more ambivalent, and that echoed and that was echoed um, by changes in architecture and interior design. And in both cases you can see that rooms were not thought um, anymore as isolated units, but in the way they related to each other. And these relationships could be managed with devices um, like glass doors, like curtains, like doors, uh, like stairs, etc. And these devices indicate the needs of reaching a careful balance um, that is distinguishing between rooms, um, but so linking different spaces, but still distinguishing between them. And the examples that I have covered uh, demonstrate that there is a general movement towards uh, flexibility, rendering spaces more ambivalent, giving them more functions. We can think of other examples, for example, um, the folding screens that architect Paul Ancar designed for uh, interiors of restaurants, which allow for an ever-changing reconfiguration of interior spaces. Or you can think as well of the furniture uh, Henri Van de Vede or Serrurier Bovy designed um, at the time, which combined different use um, in one piece of furniture, for example, uh, benches with integrated bookcase or um, uh, coat hangers with mirrors, that sort of things. And they combined several use um, and in one piece of furniture, and so they call for another definition of the space um, around them. So what I hope to have shown you is that there is a reflection um, around um, space in interiors, around the question of uh, fluidity, flexibility, and that can be seen through examining uh, threshold spaces, both in architecture and interior paintings at the time. Thank you.